Good morning. Welcome to worship here at the uh, Presbyterian and Congregational Churches of Clarion, Iowa. Uh, my name is Bill Kim. My friend Mr. Bunn is uh, not with me. I'm trying to record this at my house and then I'll share it with Ted and he will put it on the uh, website and the Facebook pages. So we'll try to end up with the same thing, but it's a little different. Um, some of you may have heard uh, my wife Carla tested positive for the COVID virus and so we are supposed to be on quarantine and we are on quarantine um, so that's why I'm in my basement trying this new way uh, to lead worship. So um, we have some uh, a newsletter that went out to both churches that talked a little bit about just some random thoughts, or not random, but some scattered thoughts of mine, and then some word about worship. Uh, what I, uh, what we are doing right now, is we are not going to have in-person worship, at least through the middle of December, and then we'll reevaluate then uh, to decide what is best to do. I appreciate your patience with this effort. Um, I appreciate your patience with um, me in general, of course. But uh, when it comes to uh, all of this mess, the COVID virus and how we respond and what we do, both of our churches have been awesome. Both of our churches have uh, taken care of each other and reached out to each other. And you'll find that in the newsletter, another encouragement. And I'll say that this morning, another encouragement for us to continue to do that. One of the suggestions was that maybe each of us would uh, give a call, send an email or a card to the people um, in front of us in the book and the people behind us in the book. So if you uh, have a second and you're able to do that, to reach out to everybody that everyone knows they're supported and cared for in this uh, struggling time. And if you have some issues, please feel free to call the church, um, the secretaries, the office managers, call me and we'll do all we can to assist and to help with whatever needs you might have and I encourage us to do that to our community as well, to be responsive and supportive of everybody in our community. The uh, bulletin is on the uh, upccia.org website, um, I believe. And if it's not there, it's on Facebook or maybe both. Um, so you congregationalists um, access some of that too. Um, so let's read together our call to worship. Um, let's just read it in unison. It's set up to read responsively but I think it's a little easier if we just read it in unison. It's based on Psalm 95, so as we gather together for worship, we read this. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before God with thanksgiving and praise God with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Come, let us bow down in worship let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. The Lord God is our only God, and we are God's people. Amen and amen. Let's pray together. God, in these difficult times, we ask for your presence. Work and school and even going out for a pizza aren't the same as it's been. Certainly worship is not. In spite of that, God, we remember that you are you. You are the king, and we are your children. And we pray that our worship experience together and that our lives would both reflect you, that you would interact with us, and we would be your people. Fill us with your spirit, we pray, for this time of worship and for every day. We pray that you would empower and strengthen us to experience and to share you. In Jesus' name, amen. I am going to skip the memory verse because I don't have it in my bulletin and I don't remember what it was. And I'm not at church, so I can't go find it real quick. Um, at both of our churches, the, the, the Congregationalists don't usually have the memory verse, but the Presbyterians do. And I apologize to you Presbyterians, I, uh, I skipped that part. Um, we always, at both churches, have a prayer of confession and reconciliation. And we say regularly that the goal of that is to build a habit um, so that we um, 
would make it a regular thing that we would pause, think about God, our walk with God, where it is and where it could be. So we do that on Sunday mornings in an effort to make that something that habitually we might do to encourage, not make, to encourage us to do that regularly. Um, the prayer of confession and reconciliation, we read together. And it says, God of grace, I confess that there are times when I do very little for others. I enjoy the abundance of food that I have, and I fail to share even my leftovers. I choose my clean, warm clothes for the day, and I ignore my neighbor who is cold. Forgive me, I pray, and help me to do better. And following that prayer, we always pause for just a couple of moments of quiet while we consider our own personal walk with God. Let's do that. I conclude our prayer of confession and reconciliation with this call. Brothers and sisters, believe and share the good news. And the congregation's response is, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. That's the best news. The best news. So this morning we're going to read uh, from the scripture. Sorry about that. This morning we're going to read from the scripture, Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Let me see if I can uh, move my screen here a little bit. So from my computer, I can read that scripture. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and the, all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. I say the word of God for the people of God, and your response is, Thanks be to God. Amen. I hope all that recorded um, well. Let me share with you just a few thoughts uh, concerning the scripture for today. Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Actually, one of my favorite scripture stories. Those that Jesus described as sheep don't remember helping Jesus, and they ask him about it. They can't think of a time that they helped Jesus, and they can't imagine how they could have missed seeing him. Those that Jesus describes as goats don't remember seeing Jesus either. But they seem to be trying to find an excuse. They seem to be saying, 
If you didn't reveal yourself, Jesus, how can we possibly be responsible to help you? The key thing that Jesus is trying to say in this parable is that the people granted access to the kingdom of God are not the people who've kept score to make sure they're doing the right thing or doing enough of the right thing. The people granted access to the kingdom of God are the people who have lived out their faith in everyday relationships. Describing the life of the disciple is one of the things that Matthew does repeatedly in his writing of the gospel in the book of Matthew. Our reading for today makes it clear that for Matthew, the life of a disciple is a life of mercy. Some folks, some folks are concerned about the identity, the exact identity of these that Jesus describes as the least of these. Some might ask if these people are believers or not believers. Are these people church members or not church members? Are these followers or are these not followers? Jesus is not real specific about answering that question. And here's my personal conclusion. It doesn't matter. The least of these that Jesus talked about are people in need. And disciples of Jesus minister to people in need, whether they are believers or not. Whether they voted like I voted or did not. Whether they are members of my church or members of another church. Whether they worship God on Sunday mornings or whether they don't worship God at all. The way I understand the scripture, I think the story that Matthew wants to teach, and I think what Jesus has to say in this scripture is, my followers... Live a life of mercy, period. When we reach out to people in need, we're actually reaching out to God. Any people in need. We're not bringing God with us when we go do ministry, like we have God in our pockets or we have God under our control. When we go do ministry, when we reach out, when we feed, when we clothe, when we visit, we're choosing to meet God at the place of need. God is already there. And our acts of mercy are us joining hands with God to take care of others. It's our agreement to say that we're on the same page with you, God. Dirk Lang, who's a professor at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota, believes that God is already outside the circle that we draw and the boundaries that we create. Unfortunately, he makes a good point. Sometimes, historically, the church has drawn boundaries. The church has drawn a circle. And we have said, if you're in this, on this side, you're with us. If you're not, then you're against us. I don't think that's God's idea. I think that's ours. Think about our idea about mission work and how that idea might be redefined if we considered the truth that moving outwards is actually moving towards God. You and I reaching out with the gospel, living lives of mercy, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting folks in jail or who are sick. When we reach out, we actually move towards God. God is already there. We're joining hands with God to minister to and to touch and to change lives, to improve and to show mercy. This judgment scene, it's not where those people who were out to get us Christians finally get what's coming to them. This judgment scene that Jesus talks about is not where all those people who were ever against Christians or the church finally get what was coming to them, finally get their just desserts. No. The judgment scene that Jesus talks about is where people who have lived a life of mercy now experience mercy for themselves. Today is Christ our King Sunday. I say we consider that. Christ is our King. And we are his people. We're challenged by Christ 
as his people to live a life of mercy to all people in every circumstance. May that be so. Amen. In our church service after the uh, homily, after the sermon time, then we pause for just a few minutes. Quiet time for folks to consider the gospel, the message, and what it might mean to them. So let's do that. Let's pause briefly. One of the things that we do at our churches is that we every week share a statement of faith. Um, we think, again, it's a good habit to build. It's good practice when we say out loud what we believe. Statement of faith is one we've used throughout the summer. Uh, we'll continue to use it tweaked just a little bit. It's on the bulletin that Ted uh, prepared if you um, have that in front of you. Let's read that in unison this morning. What do we believe? We believe that God is our creator who loves us with an everlasting love. We believe, we believe that Jesus is our savior who died for our sins and rose victorious from the grave. We believe that the Holy Spirit is our helper who gives us guidance and strength. We believe in the fellowship of God's people. We believe in everlasting life that begins today and we are called to proclaim the love of God to the world. Amen. This morning, um, I'm just going to pray briefly. Uh, I'm going to pray um, for our schools, for our staffs and our students. I'm going to pray for our nurses and doctors on the front line. I'm going to pray for our government. I'm going to pray for each of us who have been affected by the COVID-19 virus in the variety of ways that we have. Um, if you have a prayer concern and you'd like to share it with the church, again, uh, you can send it in an email, you can send it in a card, you can call the church, you can call my phone, uh, leave a message with Nancy or Kathy, and um, we'll share those with each other when we pray on Sunday mornings. Let's pause just for a second and let's pray together, okay? Lord God, we thank you for your presence in our lives. Whether we're on the floor, at our house, in the recliner, on the bed, in our pajamas, or dressed up in a shirt and tie on a Sunday morning in the church pew, we know that wherever we are, you are with us. And God, we pray for your continued presence, for your guidance, for your strength, for all of us as we deal with struggles emotionally and physically and spiritually. Um, we pray, God, for the gift and strength of your Holy Spirit. We pray for the many folks who are affected by the COVID-19 virus, those who have it, those who are recovering, those who have watched their loved ones suffer from it. We pray for nurses on the front line, and doctors, uh, care providers. We pray, God, um, for all of our first responders, for your hand and for your presence in their lives in these days. We pray for our country. We pray for our elected officials, for our president, uh, Mr. Trump, and for Vice President Pence, and for our president-elect and our vice president-elect. We pray, God, for your hand and for your presence in all of their lives. And we pray for our country, for calmness, and peacefulness. We pray, God, for all the private things that we have in our hearts and lives, for your hand and for your presence. And we pray for each of us that this week we would be your people and live lives of mercy. We thank you, God, for your love for us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
We have a benediction that's printed in the bulletin for you to read, um, one that we've used for a while now during this Thanksgiving season. Let's read that together this morning before we're done. Let us be aware of all the blessings that surround us. Let us recognize all that God has given us. Let us be inspired to pass our good fortune on to others. And let us give thanks to our Father in heaven by going forth praising God's name. Amen and amen. Thank you for your willingness to be a part of this uh, unique way for a lot of us uh, to worship. Um, thank you for sharing with us. And again, feel free to uh, call the church if you have some constructive criticism or if you have um, some prayer concerns you would like. And I encourage you to remember to reach out and support your neighbor, whether that's a community member or a church member or both this week as we all struggle through some difficult times. Bless you. Um, I look forward to hearing from you if you need that. Um, I will reach out to some of you um, as well as what you do for each other. So bless you all. And again, thank you for Mr. Bunn for posting all this stuff on the internet for us. Thank you. May God bless you.